Welcome back to the McCann Dogs Podcast, Season 3, Episode 10, and we've got a red hen. I was going to say, here we go again. I was too. But... I don't know why. <laughs> I, was, I was looking for something less expected, so hopefully I hit the mark. Uh, welcome back, everybody. We are in the podcast studio today, Instructor Robbie and myself, Instructor Shannon, and we are going to talk today a little bit about hyper dogs, and uh, this one is titled, Why Is My Dog So Hyper? So we today our plan is to sort of break down some of the things that create hyper dogs and some of the things that help to cure the creation of hyper dogs and some of the ways that you can stave off having a hyper dog by um, putting a little bit more emphasis on the order in which you teach things. So today on the McCann Dogs podcast, the order of things really matters. And um, elaborate a little bit, Robbie, what do I mean by the order of things really matters when it comes to hyper dogs? Yeah, I think um, a lot of people unknowingly turn their dogs into crazy hyper dogs by not actually teaching the dog how to be calm first. You know, they, they, they just jump into things and they pump the dog up and they do all sorts of things that inadvertently reward the dog for, for being hyper and losing emotional control. And they do that before they've actually taught the dog how to settle and how to be calm and that there's value for being settled and for being calm. And let's let's clarify this a little bit, because if you were to go to an agility trial or a fly ball um, competition or tomorrow. nice, that mm -hmm. sounds fun. And so it's going to be chaos. It's it going to be a whole lot of dogs behaving very hyperly. So what's the difference in that situation? These dogs that are at fly ball that are barking their heads off and running. And, you know, if you've never seen fly ball, it is a relay race where dogs run down over four hurdles, trigger a box, which will throw out a ball and they are to catch the ball and then race back along the four hurdles. And there are four dogs per team. It's basically a relay race. And it's utter chaos it in sure a building is. that there is fly ball going on. There's a lot of hyper dogs there. So what's the difference in that situation? Why is it okay for them to be hyper there? It's okay because they're trained. They are trained mm -hmm. to listen. They're trained to focus on their job and they know how to manage their emotions. So when they're playing the game, they are on, they're highly, highly stimulated but they're listening. And that's the big difference is that they're listening and they're focused. And, um, you know, I think about my own dogs and, and how, you know, my expectations are that when you're racing, I want you to be on a hundred percent, but when you're not racing, I expect you to be calm. I expect you to maintain control and I expect you to listen. So it's all about what you expect and what you teach your dogs. Perfect. So in this situation, I think it's fair to say that it's nice to have a balance in life. Mm -hmm. And in this situation, this is an outlet for the hyperactivity. That's the thing. It's not that you're never going to have a dog who has energy to spend. It's not that you're going to have a dog that just learns to live their life in a calm and steady fashion. It's that if you have a good balance with your dog, you will have outlets for the hyperactivity that are appropriate outlets. And then they will, as they get older, you know, puppies are a little bit different because they there's this thing called self-regulation with dogs where they will learn to... Um, they'll learn to put themselves down for naps so that they can conserve energy for the hunt, for example. This is the instinctual behavior. They will learn to eat until they're full and then not gorge themselves. You know, you don't see overweight uh, wolves out there in the wild, you know. Self-regulation is a very important thing, but puppies don't do it. So a lot of the times puppies are just, ah, hyper crazy all over the place all the time. But that is the time where we're going to teach them how to have skills and how to have what you called managing their emotions. Um, I think that is one of the most important things that we can teach our dogs is how to manage our emotions. So getting a little bit more in into this then. If I have a dog, if I have a young dog that I have um, in training, tell me first and foremost, uh, what am I doing in my life in terms of management to try to make sure that he doesn't learn to be hyper first? Yeah, it's about, it's about teaching some skills and managing their situation so that they're not able to um, behave in a way where they're hyper and they're not listening. And then they self-reinforce by, you know, chasing the cats around the house cats. or, um, you know, 
trying to fence run with the neighbor's dog, that sort of thing. So what we want to do is we want to teach some control exercises, some exercises that encourage the dog or the puppy to think and to be calm and to focus. And then once we have that, then we can start to build that, that excitement so that we're building some excitement, but being able to return to calm building more excitement, returning to calm. And we need to teach the calm first. Mm -hmm. I love that, uh, what you just said, returning to calm. And I think that that is such an important thing for a dog to be able to do. And if we don't teach them how to do it, they won't. They'll just follow their natural instincts Mm -hmm. to be as excited and as hyper as they want to be. So if we can practice things like we have a a skill that we teach called play and settle, Mm -hmm. which we teach our dogs to turn on the party, you know, have a little game play with me. Uh, We have videos on our YouTube of Play and Settle if you wanted to see this in action. But basically, this is the time. This is the outlet. This is the time you get to be hyper. Let's let's play. Let's have a little party together. We're going to announce it. We're going to start it. And we're going to control it a little bit with some rules. So general rules with a young puppy. Tell me some of the things that um, you would include in your play rules so that it's not just hyperactivity without any sort of direction or expectation. Yeah. When, when I'm playing with a puppy, first thing I want to do is I want to teach the puppy to interact with me without biting me, without grabbing my clothing, that sort of thing. So I want the, I want the play and I want the fun, but I want there to be rules that go along with it. It's not like you said, just a free for all where they get to do whatever the heck they want. Um, which with dogs usually means biting, you know, we the yeah, people dog we stuff. See, yeah, exactly. You know, dogs play with their mouth. It's a given. That's how dogs play. And it's up to us to teach them that there are certain times where you can't play like that just because it's just not acceptable play with a human. Absolutely. And that really is a distinction that we need to make because dogs don't come thinking, okay, what should I do differently with you? They're mm-hmm. going to follow their hardwired instinct. And it's up to us to say, you know what? That's not appropriate. You can't use your teeth on a human. So consistent information and making sure that you're being clear with them, that their teeth are not allowed on our skin. They're not allowed to pull at our clothes, et cetera. It's okay for you to tug on a toy, but you can't tug on my sleeve. And I know that um, just saying that, I know that I can hear people thinking, oh, dogs can't differentiate between that. Sure, they can. Yeah, you bet. They with, with definitely can. Yes, Absolutely. Can. As, yeah, and that's it. That's it. I'm so glad you said that because it really is up to us to help them make that distinction. And my trained dogs, I expect to make that distinction on their own. It's their responsibility to be careful with their teeth all of the time. And it's very rare that they have an accidental slip where they accidentally touch my skin. And I know it's been an extreme accident because they work really hard nice. not to do that because I've given them consistent information. So um, what, what's one of the tactics that you would take if you were in the middle of a game and you um, your puppy started doing or your young dog started doing something that you didn't like? What's a tactic that you, that you would take right away? First thing I would do is I would end the game. Brilliant. And Why take, is that? And just take control of the dog because we want to just end, end the fun. We want them to learn that You do this particular behavior and suddenly the fun ends, Mm -hmm. you know, when dogs aren't dumb, they figure out pretty quick, well, that didn't work out so great for me. I don't think I'll repeat that behavior. And it's just a nice, easy way of teaching the dog what our rules are. Absolutely. And this is where it comes down to helping them understand what we expect, not assuming they're being stubborn because they're doing something that we don't like and making sure that we reinforce the things that we do like. So you have called playtime. You've had a moment where the dog has maybe done something that you don't like. They've jumped up on you or if that's something you're not willing to allow in play, um, they have used their teeth on your skin or your clothes, you immediately end the game to let them know fun ends. It does not continue if you don't follow the rules. So if on the other hand, you're playing and all is going well, so you're, you know, you're down low and you're playing with the dog and then you decide that the game is over. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah. So as soon as, so when, when I'm playing with my dog, I'll get down low. So I'll, so I look a little bit more like a litter mate. I, you know, I don't get right on the ground with them because I'm not very mobile anymore and I can't get up on my feet very quickly. <laughs> so I just, you know, I'll bend over a little bit, move around, have a bit of fun with my dog. When I want the game to end, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to change my body position because dogs are masters of reading body language. And as soon as I stand up, the dog recognizes that change you know, you go from being low like a litter mate to standing up more like a leader. And they, they recognize that right away. Doesn't mean anything necessarily to them right away, but they recognize it. And then what we do is we have the dogs settle and sit. And so then eventually the dog learns that when I get down low and I play, party is on. As soon as I stand up and I assume that position where I look like I'm in control, 
they'll automatically stop playing. You know, it gets to the point where you don't even need to tell them to settle and sit. They recognize the difference between play body language yeah. and that control body language. I love that. And it really is that simple. You know, a, a lot of the times people in class, when we get to the playtime settle and sit exercise, we will say, okay, call playtime. And inevitably we'll see somebody not playing with their dog. So we'll go over and, you know, what's up? You know, what? how, how can we help? And a lot of times people will want to avoid playing because, you know what, mm. I start playing and she bites me when we're playing. Playing. And it's like, yes, you know what? This is the time to deal with that. Like you can't keep, you can't just suppress these behaviors because the biting is going to come out in some situation. Right. If you have a pup that still doesn't understand that putting their mouth on you is not acceptable, there's going to be a moment when that behavior comes out. And it's so important that we help them understand that this is not an acceptable thing. So being consistent and actually using these exercises to bring bring out those bad behaviors so that you can deal with them. Right. You know, avoiding them is not going to work long term. At some point, that strate- that strategy is going to fail on you. So it is crucial that we have situations where we can say, okay, this is where we're going to teach the dog not to use their teeth then. Mm-hmm. This is where we're going to head, we're going to face this head on and we're going to give them nice clear criteria. And some of the tips maybe if you have a dog that is already really full of beans and they've got lots of energy. If you have a dog that um, goes over the top a little bit in play, what are some of the tactics that you would use to try to take some of the energy out of that play and keep things a little bit more positive so that you can continue to build on it? Yeah, it's a good question. And and, and I think a, a big mistake that a lot of people make when they're first starting to play with their dogs is that they don't they don't set the dog up for success, you know, and with the McCann method, our goal is to set the dog up for success so they can be right. And then we gradually build on that success. And, um, you know, I'll tell you one of the things that I see so often with people when they're first starting to teach their dogs how to engage and play with them is that they play, the, the human plays in such a way that it actually <clears throat> encourages the dog to bite them, you know, and Elaborate a little bit on that. What yeah. are some of the things that people do that encourage the puppy to bite them or yeah, the dog to bite them? They'll, one of my pet peeves I'll say is when people, you know, they encourage the dog to play and the first thing they do is they reach down and they're waving their hands all over in front of the dog's face, you know, and especially a puppy, you know, they're going to bite your hands yeah. because it's right there and it's an invitation for them to bite because that's what puppies do. Mm-hmm. So we want to try and set the puppy up in a way when we're playing with them, we're inviting them to engage with us, but we're not sending them over the top where the first thing they think to do is grab onto something with their mouth. Yeah. So I, you know, if I think about what I do with my puppies when I'm first beginning is my play part of the exercise might last five, maybe 10 seconds as opposed to, you know, three minutes of play where the dog gets more yeah. and more and more pumped. And then three minutes over is an the eternity. Top. Holy geez. I don't know how yeah. people have that kind of energy anyways, <laughs> but you know, I'll play for just a few seconds just to get my dog engaged with me. And then from there I'll work the settle sit and mm-hmm. I'll build lots of value for that settle sit. And then that way, when they have the value for the settle sit and they understand, you know, they're starting to understand that when you're playing, play, but don't use your mouth, then I'll gradually build that length of play. And then I'll gradually build the intensity of the play as well with the expectation that is that, yes, it's more fun, but you still need to be careful with your teeth. But I think a mistake that people make, like I said, is they just ask for too much too soon. They have these high expectations that their dog's going to play with them and have a wonderful time and not use their mouth. And that's just so unrealistic, especially for a puppy. Yeah, absolutely. And if you think about, you know, if you wanted your dog to use their mouth in play, you'd be wiggling a toy around on the mm-hmm, ground in front of mm-hmm. them or maybe, you know, uh, wiggling it in front of their face, trying to entice them and get them excited so that they'd reach out and grab that. So it's natural that if you were doing the same thing with your hands or, you know, if, when people start playing with their puppies and they start batting them on the side of the head. Yes. That is definitely going to get a puppy agitated to start biting you. So um, if you think about you can push away on their body a little bit for example. So you might, if you have a lab that's like a really crash and burn type of body slamming type of player, um, giving them a little push away will make them want to come back at you a little bit harder for some fun and being strategic with where you do that pushing on their chest versus on their face and in their head Mm -hmm. will probably result in them coming back and having more fun versus coming back and trying to grab at your hands with their mouth, et cetera. Um, Rules are up to you in play. I always like Mm -hmm. to say that to people. Uh, 
you might not mind your dog jumping up on you and play. I don't mind my dogs jumping up on me and play. I actually invite it because that means that I don't have to bend over (laughs) to get down (laughs) to them. Yeah, they can come up to me and then I don't need to worry about, uh, you know, if we're playing with a tug toy, for example. I think that um, early on in my training with Quincy, being a Rottweiler, she was so strong that like me leaning over when she was tugging was grounds for me to end up falling on on my face. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I think I got used to having the dog come up to me so that I could brace myself. And and now I have tollers, of course, which are much more gentle for tugging. I certainly don't worry (laughs) nearly as much about um, being solidly on the ground with my tollers. They're just not as strong as my Rottweiler was. So (coughs) excuse me. Some other things that tend to lead to hyperactivity. You mentioned length. So you mentioned keeping your sessions from like five to 10 seconds so that you can have this situation where it's a nice little ramp up and then sort of settle in. Do you get longer with the play as your puppies get older? Absolutely. The play gets longer. The play gets more intense, um, you know, and, and you can build that very easily once they do- the dog has that basic foundation of understanding, you know, play, engage, but don't bite my clothes, don't bite me, you know. And then, like you said, other rules, they're up to you, whether you yeah. want your dog to bark and play, whether you want your dog to jump on you and play. You know, if your dog was to do something, like say, for example, you don't want your dog barking and play, then all we would do is we would just automatically end the game. Yeah. We wouldn't necessarily right. correct the dog. We would just say to them, oh, you're barking. I don't want that. We're going to end the play. And then the dog learns, okay, well, hmm, I want to play, but if I bark, the play ends. So therefore, I'm not going to bark anymore. Yeah, they learn to have emotional control Mm -hmm. about that specific thing. And this is where managing emotions comes into play. This is where it really counts because we're not trying to artificially take the hyperactivity out Mm -hmm. of our dog. We're trying to make sure that it gets channeled to good use. Um, Dogs are what they are. You know, dogs come with a certain amount of energy depending on what their breed tendencies are, depending on what their natural tendencies are. They're going to have energy. And, you know, if we can vent that energy in productive ways, then we end up with a dog who is well satiated instead of hyper. So that's what training and management is all about. And on that note, some of the reasons that people end up with dogs that are hyper, um, Some of them are because we haven't put in the training effort. So talking about hyperactivity maybe out on the street, because I know this Mm -hmm. is something that um, a lot of people struggle with. We did... We did an episode a couple of episodes ago on uh, reactivity with dogs, and this is sort of right up that topic. Some of the things that maybe set people back, what's one of the first things that come to mind when you're just just talking about life out there on the street, if you're going to take your dog for a walk? Yeah, when you're, when you're out walking your dog, you're inevitably going to encounter different distractions, you know, squirrels, other dogs. Squirrel. Yeah, squirrel. Uh, people riding by on a bicycle or a skateboard or those, you know, the kids on their scooters these days, you know, and those are all things that... Um, <laughs> What's so funny about it's scooters? Just, just the way you said that, kids, kids on, on their scooters. scooters these days. I know. I, I can't tell you the number of times I've al- almost been mowed down at the park by these kids blasting past me on their scooters. It's amazing how fast they can go. But those are stimulating things for yes, a lot of absolutely. dogs. absolutely. Right? You know, things that move fast gets their attention because mm-hmm. they're predators and that's instinctual for them. And um, so what happens then is dogs get excited by those things. And then when they get excited and the human isn't able to control the dog, that excitement just gets more and more and more intense. And, um, you know, and then you think about situations like other dogs or people, you know, and there's a lot of super friendly dogs out there who, you know, they love people, they love to see other dogs and they get really excited. Mm-hmm. And then quite often people make the mistake of they, re- they recognize their dog's excited and they, they, they see that the dog clearly wants to go and engage. And what they do is they then say, well, my dog wants to visit. I'm going to take him over and let him visit and let him have a little bit of social time. And it's not that you can't mm-hmm. let your dog visit and have some social time with some friendly stranger out on the street. We wouldn't suggest that with a dog you don't know. But the problem is, is if you bring your dog to go greet in a situation where they're over the top with excitement, you're reinforcing that. Yeah. And then the dog then learns, oh, the more excited I get, the more inclined my human is to bring me over to visit. And then that just creates a huge problem. Yeah. And this sort of falls into the category that I call, I'll fix it later. 
Uh-huh. These are the moments where we are overwhelmed by whatever the situation may be. You know, you've just brought your dog to the park and maybe you don't even know that this is setting yourself up for a little bit of a harder time later on down the road, but you brought your dog to the park. And a lot of the times it's in the name of socialization that we run into the I'll fix it later um, category of thinking. And we end up in a situation where we allow the dog to first get reinforced for the exact wrong thing that we don't want them to do. And we also end up in a situation where often that reinforcement gets rehearsed over and over and over again because of that I'll fix it later mentality. And it all ends up being this big tumbleweed going downhill and picking up momentum to get to the point where our dogs are over actively hyper because they see something stimulating and that is what they've rehearsed doing. So this situation that we've set up here, they see that dog or person across the park, they go, wee, I'm so excited to see you. They pull to get to them or go a little bit, uh, a little bit wiry to get to them or whatever the case may be. And then when they actually, when it works, it reinforces that behavior. So if I'm pulling to go and get to that person on the other side of the park and my pulling works to get me to the person on the other side of the park and that was my objective, that tactic worked for me. It doesn't matter that there's somebody on the on the end of the leash mm-hmm. that's trying to hold me back. That just becomes part of the background noise because this is what I do. This is what I've practiced. It's what I rehearse. And it's what becomes second nature to the dog, right. essentially. So it is so important so important that the I'll fix it later mentality goes out the window. And we've done, um, we've done episodes on socialization, of course, and the, um, the fallacies that run along with socialization, uh, having to actually interact with things is not the goal of socialization, being able to exist around things, being Mm -hmm. able to be responsive and listen and really be neutral about about um, different things in the environment. That is the goal of socialization for our dogs so that when they see a person on the other side of the park, they go, oh, there's a person on the other side of the park. They're obviously off limits to me because they're on the other side of the park and they're not my human. So they only become within limits for the dog when we say, oh, there's a person over there, go say hi, Right? right? So the default behavior is really so much better to set up as something favorable to what you want versus setting up the default behavior as you see the thing, you get to go and and visit with the thing, you get to go and party with the thing, and that I'll fix it later attitude, you know, eventually ends up with the dog just being stuck in the backyard because they're so hard to manage Absolutely, out there on the street, yeah. which is the really unfortunate thing about it. Um, so the hyperactivity in terms of putting the cart before the horse and going out there and letting the dog, um, letting the dog get overstimulated by things in the environment. That is definitely one way to create a situation where your dog is too hyperactive. Um, the focus on socialization being interaction versus observation is one way to do it. Uh, getting by in the moment is another one that I have down here. And it's sort of similar to the I'll fix it later, but sometimes it's more of a exasperation. And I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example of the getting by in the moment that I can think of that I always think of. <laughs> when I was training Jaden, so this was back 2001. So we're, we're, we're going back a long ways now, you know, 2022 now. I know. And every time I'm like, oh, yeah, I've been at McCann's for 20 years. And I'm like, oh, wait, that was like three or four years ago. So it just keeps accumulating. I forgot we keep getting older. But at any rate, so I remember training Jaden and I remember I was doing let's go healing exercises in my survey, my old survey that I lived in. So up and down the sidewalk. And there was a person coming behind me with a dog. And I really desperately in that moment just wanted to sort of sort of step off the path and place Jaden in the sit and just have him sit while this dog was was passing and this dog in person was passing. And in that moment, Jaden was having a really hard time. He was still really young and I was still pretty green as a trainer. So we were both struggling a little bit and I wasn't quite getting the message through to him in that moment. And he was desperate to see this little boxer dog that was coming up the street. And I was trying to persevere, trying to persevere. And then as they got closer, I thought this isn't going to work. I'm going to step away even further. And in that moment... The person with the boxer was like, oh, they're never going to. The boxer puppy was also very excited to see Jaden. And the person with the boxer puppy said, oh, they're never going to settle until we let them say hello. And in that moment, this is one of the ones that I always think back to and regret. (laughs) In that moment, I was like, "Okay, I don't want to be rude here. And I really am struggling. And I just want this moment to be over. So, okay, I'll let them say hi. And, you know, I'm 
I know you you're did? looking at me I'm like I'm shocked. You are shocked because that was me 20 years ago before I got, you know, the confidence to say, no, you know what? I'm training my dog. Thank you so much. But this is in my best, best interest right mm. now. I know wow. it's funny because I, I would never so now, I would never now. I, but, but I'm also, you know, I, I've, I've rehearsed saying to people, oh, sorry, no, he's in training. I don't want to say hi. So it's much easier for right. me now. Yeah, yeah. But then I was still young and I was worried about being rude and, 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 <laughs> but I think back to that. And I think that was absolutely a getting by in in that moment and then worrying about it later. So things like that, as I said, these days I would have said, nope, sorry, I'm going to stick to my guns because this dog needs to understand that he needs to listen. When I tell him to do something, he needs to listen. And I, you know, not being rough with him, I'm just placing him in the sit. But the problem with letting it go in that moment is the message that it gave Jaden. Mm -hmm. And I did struggle a lot with that dog when he was a young dog. And uh, I earned a lot of stripes with him because he was a very independent dog. And Quincy wasn't. So my Rottweiler before Jaden was very, very eager to work, very eager to do everything. And then Jaden came along and he was sort of like, he could take or leave it. He was really independent. He liked doing his own thing. And I really had to make it worth his while for him mm -hmm. to go, oh, okay, you got something in it for me. And we ended up having a fabulous relationship. And Because you had to work hard. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I'll tell you, I learned a lot with that dog, yeah, no too. Doubt. I learned way more with that dog than I did with Quincy, who was much more mm -hmm. eager to work and cooperative. The, the uh, dogs the, teach us things. Absolutely. Yeah. And I'm so grateful for Jane. And you know what? Since we're going down this road, I will say that I went all the way from Ontario, Canada to uh, British Columbia, Canada to pick up Ned because he was related to Jaden and I wanted something going and back Ned's to Jaden. So me. yeah, he is. So even though I struggled with that dog as a puppy and I thought many times I wanted to sell him or give him back or, you know, whatever the frustration point was. We got it together and he was the dog. Like I, I would love to have eight Jadens now. Like I just, yeah. I just loved that dog so much. And he was such a great dog, but he made me work for it. I, and I remember yeah. long walks between me and you chatting about training yeah. as we walked the McCann property talking about. Hmm, Absolutely. Robbie, help me, will. help me. I can't break through with this dog. <laughs> you know, the struggles are real sometimes. Yeah. Every dog provides us new challenges and new struggles. They make us better trainers. Absolutely. That's the thing. Stick with it. When they challenge you, stick with it because eventually you're going to be on the other side of it going, oh my gosh, I dealt with that. It worked. Mm -hmm. And now I know what to do moving forward. Because of course my dogs after that got much easier because I we're knew better. the mistakes I made with Jaden. Yeah. It wasn't that they were better dogs. It wasn't that they were extremely were different dogs. Exactly. And I changed my expectations a lot too, because I recognized as I was struggling with Jaden, he could meet those expectations. If I stuck to it, mm -hmm. he would too. And it was, it was a very, uh, it was a very good early lesson for me, especially after Quincy. It was actually a really good order because uh, if the harder dog had come first, I might not have known <laughs> what a great reward was at the end of it, right? Anyways. Um, alrighty. So uh, that sort of gets us into rewarding the wrong things, which was really the problem there with Jaden. He got a reward for struggling and fighting against me, and I basically taught him to persevere until I gave in, which is the polar opposite of what I ever want to teach my dogs now. I want to teach my dogs now that you don't fight, you don't struggle, you never win by doing that. You win all sorts of wonderful things in life by being cooperative. So this is where training comes into play. Yeah. So in the spirit of the order of things really matters, tell me what you're doing with your dogs before you go to the park where you might possibly run into that person that might make them hyper. Yeah, I'm, I'm training basic skills in a not very low distraction environment. Usually I'll start right inside the house, you know, and I want to work things Love like, that. can I hold your collar and have you just calmly hang in with me? Will you sit and remain sitting until I tell you, okay, and let you get up? You know, will you look at me when I ask you for attention? You know, just basic things like that, that get the dog focused and thinking. And then once they have skills, we take those skills on the road. So Perfect. I would never, you know, bring a young puppy with no skills to the park and start training my skills there because um, it would be so frustrating. It would be frustrating for me and 
possibly frustrating for the dog or possibly fun for the dog when yeah. they learn to ignore me. So, you know, you, we want, we want to teach all of our skills somewhere quiet where it's easy and where we can build value for those skills, mm -hmm. build our relationship with the dog and then start to introduce those more distracting things out in the real world. Yeah, absolutely. So to sort of wrap things up on the, um, on the distraction front, if you start with the distractions there in your dogs, it, you're not able to really break through with the ideas of what you want your dogs to do. They're going to end up learning to rehearse the things that you don't want them to do. So it is really, it's, it's strategic to start in a quiet room. We call it the white room yeah. and then build on that. So I don't stay in the quiet room for very long. Um, I might do, you know, if, it, so say for example, I'm teaching my dog the start of healing behavior. I'm going to start in the white room. Once my dog understands that it is pleasant to be at my left side and he's getting lots of rewards for walking at my left side or being stationary at my left side, I'm going to start to add to the white room. So right. that might be two or three repetitions before I move out of the white room. And I'm not moving from the from the white room to Disney. I am moving from the white room to a slightly ivory room. <laughs> Right. <laughs> if that makes sense. So I'm coming down like just towards beige. Uh, I might add uh, a little distraction. So maybe if I'm doing let's go, I might now call my partner into the room and say, hey, stand in the middle of the room. I'm going to do some walking around you. And I might just do my healing training, circling my partner, who my dog, my puppy, of course, is going to know very well at that point. Not super novel, but enough of an additional distraction that it's something. Or I might throw a toy out in the corner and then do some let's go and work on even sometimes releasing my dog to the toy as part of the reward. Like that's that's a fun game, right? Surprise, we run, we grab the yeah. toy and we have a little play. You know, it doesn't have to be this static situation where it's just boring, boring. You can have little intermittent parties with your puppy and work in, you know, we were talking about the play and settle. We do a ton of play when we're training with our dogs. It's it, it's formal mixed with play so that they learn that the formal stuff is fun too. Um, one final thing that I wanted to really talk about before we wrap up this episode, we're getting a little bit long here, is the freedom portion of things. Mm -hmm. How does freedom factor into the hyperactivity quotient with dogs? Yeah, when we give the dog too much freedom, the dog is going to naturally engage in behaviors that they find self-reinforcing. And the problem is when they're doing that and we don't have control over them, they're learning that it's fun to do their own thing. And then it just snowballs from there. Yeah. You know, you have a dog who happens to be in the backyard and suddenly they spot the squirrel running along the fence and off they go. And then they get pumped, you know, chasing the squirrel yeah. becomes fun. Now they're out <laughs> there hunting, looking for every possible squirrel they can see. And, uh, you know, it gets to the point where the dog's just highly stimulated and we have no control because yeah. we haven't taught them the calm or the listening skills to begin with. Yeah. And if they have too much freedom and they're out there doing those things repetitively on their own and nobody's telling them that it's wrong to chase the squirrel and nobody is working on teaching the dog to be able to listen when they're chasing a squirrel so that you can break through that prey drive, et cetera. And then you go out in the real world and you encounter a squirrel. Well, that prey drive has been well rehearsed and the recall potentially has not. So mm -hmm. it's so important that we are not giving our dogs all this freedom and all this opportunity to make the wrong choices and practice the wrong things yeah. while we're trying to train and get that information in. And we can help you so much with the order of things in any of our online training programs. We train both online and in person. We've been uh, in place in Flamborough, Ontario since 1982, which is 40 years as of this year, which is just unbelievable. McCann Professional dog trainers. Incredible. Yeah. And we are now in 54 countries all over the world with our online training. It's very humbling. How, where, you did private lessons yesterday. For, I did. Tell me actually. where you did private lessons yesterday. Oh, I did five private lessons yesterday. Mm -hmm. It was a busy day. Um, and I ended my two last private lessons. Um, the first one was in Auckland, New Zealand, and the second was in Melbourne, Australia. Amazing. So and we're in that, Canada. <laughs> yeah. It's so funny because I, you know, here it is for me, it's like, you know, evening and I'm, you know, feeling tired and almost ready for bed. And then meanwhile, over there, it's yeah, morning. morning, you know, they're drinking <laughs> their morning coffee and we're chatting about their day. And, you know, it's just, it's such an interesting feeling, but yeah, it's amazing. You know, 
great opportunity to help people with their dogs all over the world. It is so cool. Yeah. So cool. Yeah. To if be anybody had people. ever told me years ago that I would be doing dog training lessons over Zoom, I would have been thinking, no way. Well, I wouldn't have even known what Zoom was at the time. <laughs> but uh, it is truly incredible what it you can really accomplish, is. you know. Absolutely amazing. amazing. Absolutely. So join us. Uh, we have online training programs for puppies not coming home yet. You can do some prep work with us. You can join us for Puppy Essentials once your puppy is uh, home, right, from eight weeks of age. And uh, join us in life skills. And then we also have um, a ma monthly membership program where we talk higher learning concepts. So all sorts of great options. And you can check those things out at the McCandogs.com website. And on that note, I'm Shannon. I'm Robbie. Happy training. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the McCann Dogs podcast. And if you'd like some more training resources, be sure to check us out on YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook at McCann Dogs. And if you'd like to train with us online, be sure to check out the show notes below for our My Dog Can online training program, where we know in just a few weeks, your dog will become a well-behaved family member. Until then, happy training. Happy training.